Good afternoon. I wanted to put a video up. I wasn't in my uh, pulpit today, but uh, thankful to uh, have a little time away. But uh, for those who watch the videos, enjoy uh, uh, putting something up. And uh, this afternoon, I wanted to uh, share a portion of scripture with you in uh, uh, a simple message, if you will, and uh, read out 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just uh, three verses today. Paul writes, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And I want to think on that last phrase that Paul used right there, the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, you know, we live in a, a world that uh, seemingly becomes more complicated all the time. I uh, joke, I tell my wife all the time, I'm a simpleton and I uh, like simple things. Sometimes uh, uh, a lot of things, if they're just too complicated, they just sort of get frustrated and we, uh, all of us are, I guess, sort of like that. And, you know, we appreciate some things that are simple and it seems like uh, maybe things at one time that we thought were simple, they've somewhat become a little more complicated as the process goes, uh, no matter what that is, whether uh, just uh, uh, our phones, for instance, they're a little more complicated than they used to be. Uh, even our TVs are a little more complicated. Uh, I'm one of them people. I don't need a bunch of buttons on my remote. Uh, just uh, volume up and down, channel up and down. I'm good. I'm going to find it. And uh, sort of a surfer. And uh, I guess a lot of men sort of fall into that. But, you know, a lot of things we become, uh, seems like we, uh, and, and some people like that. They like all the options. They like all that. And some folks, you know, think we need to uh, have some things that are a little different. But for a lot of us, we want some things that are maybe just easy. And uh, we sort of champion those things in life that seem to be uh, simple, as we might say. Because, again, they, they're less frustrating, to be honest, and seem like it makes life a little more uh, peaceable just if you can do something and it doesn't take maybe as much effort, as much thought, especially simple things, as we would say. You know, it's interesting that Paul would use this phrase concerning Christ, uh, because when we think of the Bible and we think about Jesus, um, his life was nothing uh, of simple nature. Now, humble, yes. Uh, maybe his his background, we might say, uh, yes, you know, a uh, simple life, a uh, carpenter life. And uh, then he went about, uh, when he began his earthly ministry and what we know about him, for three and a half years, we might say he goes far from being simple. Matter of fact, probably on a, uh, on a real uh, just uh, advanced part as far as just traveling. When you figure travel in the day was either by, uh, they traveled by boat some from one place to the other, by uh, animal some, I'm sure, uh, from uh, just taking that from one place to the other. A lot of it was just walking. And uh, so, again, um, when you look at the day and the time, we might say to visit all the places he did, that life surely wasn't always simple. To encounter the people he encountered, life surely wasn't always simple. And, of course, Jesus embraced that because that was his earthly ministry and what he was called to do and why he was here on this earth to set the examples fulfill scripture and to uh, end up being the sacrificial lamb, which he came to do and to pay for the sins of the world. But when Paul uses a phrase, and Paul especially, uh, we know of Paul giving us the doctrines of the church, and we know him for that, the book of Romans especially. Uh, Christ seems anything but simple uh, when we see him displayed in the book of Romans, and all that was done for us on the behalf of our salvation, uh, justification by faith explained, uh, again, the resurrection and even to the first letter to the Corinthian church in chapter 15, he explains the resurrection in great detail. And it seems anything but simple. As a matter of fact, people have wrote volumes on just uh, those doctrines themselves. And we've talked much about it. And we can preach that surely some of those things come about, theologically speaking, as complicated. And, uh, and maybe sometimes even not hard to understand, but without an element of faith, they become something that uh, some people might uh, confuse and they might wonder about and they might question. And so there is a certain amount of uh, understanding when we say that Christ, Paul wants to uh, preach and that he wants this church to understand the simplicity of Christ. And uh, he goes back and he gives a, an interesting example 
about something. He says, as the serpent beguiled Eve, and uh, he said he came in a very subtle way. And again, it was something that Eve wasn't uh, unprepared for as far as uh, uh, maybe having a conversation with the animals. Uh, her and Adam, uh, obviously God had placed in the garden. Adam had named the animals. Uh, they probably had a, an interesting relationship there that we may not quite uh, fully understand. And we're not given a lot of detail in scripture. But yet she wasn't a fearful of the serpent when it came. And yet Satan had entered into it and he would beguile Eve and he would deceive her. And therefore, we would, of course, have the events that we many times sum up as the fall of man. And Adam would sin. Eve would sin first. And Adam would follow that. And again, we have all mankind plunged into sin over those particular things. But it said that the serpent uh, would deceive her and beguile her. And again, it was one of those things that Paul was using as an example. And that he said that uh, he didn't want this church to be corrupted from the simplicity that is Christ. If we continued on uh, to verse 4, he talked about people who would come preaching another Jesus. And that's something that he's uh, used that phrase uh, in some of his other writings. But another Jesus, and essentially meaning one that uh, doesn't come as Paul preached, and that someone would come preaching about Christ being someone who he is not. He also mentions about that they might receive another spirit. And there are many spirits in this world, let us understand that. Uh, we live in a very uh, spiritual world, whether we see that or not, and whether we acknowledge that or not. As a matter of fact, uh, if you keep on reading in this chapter, it even tells us that Satan and uh, is transformed himself into an angel of light, and that there are those many things and stuff that are out there to deceive us, and that they can even uh, appear uh, as false apostles and deceitful workers and things of Christ. And so Satan himself does much to deceive mankind still yet today. And so when we think of this and we think of all that's out there, and again, uh, the another gospel, another spirit, another Christ, that Paul warns of these things, that he goes back and he reminded the church that again, that they would not be corrupted, that their minds would not be corrupted through the simplicity that is in Christ. I want to think on that very quickly, that phrase uh, for you this afternoon, as we ponder about that, and we ponder about something that is truly simple, according to the Word of God, but so often Satan and man himself turns that into something that is not so easy and not so simple. Christ himself, uh, when we think about it, like we said, uh, he had a very humble beginning. His life, his journey in this world might be something that would be, uh, we might say a little more uh, detailed and complicated just because of how he traveled, how he did, what he did in this world, the things he did. But let us think in particular about three things. We might could make a little longer of a list if we thought about it for a while, but I came up with three things. I think they're important, and I think it's something that we want to keep when we think of Christ, and we want to keep it simple, and keep it simple that, again, because I think it is made simple, for you and I in Scripture. And let us not uh, frustrate the grace of God or frustrate the things of Christ, because I think Satan does all he can do to deceive and to do that for folks as well. And the first thing that I might think about is just the work of Christ and the fact that our salvation was paid in full by him. Paul would call him in Hebrews the author and finisher of our faith. You know, uh, we read the accounts in Scripture, and we know what Jesus did, the fact that he would uh, leave heaven, he would be the Messiah that was promised, he would be born of a virgin and come to this earth and uh, grow up, and we again don't have a lot of detail about that early life, but then we do have his earthly ministry and what he would come to do, and that particular uh, object of what he came to do was exactly how John the Baptist would see him. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And we see John announcing him when he sees Jesus. And Jesus would come into this world with a purpose, with a mission. And that particular mission was to be that sacrificial lamb on the cross of Calvary and to pay the sin debt for all mankind. And matter of fact, when we look at it, it's paid in full. You know, uh, that's a, a goal, it seems like, of everybody who's ever took out a a loan or a note or borrowed something, 
is that we would finally get that statement, if you will, uh, that declared that everything was paid off and that everything was completely paid. There was nothing left owed, nothing left to do. Uh, and again, we could file that away and saying that it is now completely ours and that we own that. And so uh, we all understand uh, maybe that statement, if you've uh, lived in this world much, and especially maybe as an adult and borrowed or, and or uh, had something that you've had to work for and had to uh, either pay or to do something to earn it. And yet we find that it was paid in full. But when we read about our salvation and all of the physical part of it, that that's exactly what we find in Jesus. And the fact that he paid that price on the cross of Calvary. He did that and he finished that. And even one of the sayings that he would utter from the cross of the seven that he would give that day when he was crucified, he would say, it is finished. And to say that, and by the son of God himself declaring that all that was necessary was done at that time. And so let us again, not frustrate those things. Let us again not allow the things of Satan and the things of this world to come in and to say that there is still something yet to do. Jesus paid it all. And I believe that when we think of the simplicity of Christ, and we especially think of the simplicity of the gospel and the message of it, that we first have to understand that all was paid for by the death of Christ on the cross and his burial and his resurrection. All was paid for and all was completed that day. Let us again not be deceived to think that there is something else. We want to keep that simple, do we not? It was simply done by Jesus. And even though it wasn't simple acts, because again, God turned his back on his only son that day. He forsook him as the sin of the world was placed upon him. My sin, your sin, the sin of all, whether they acknowledge him in this world or not, he paid their sin debt. And let us understand that a simple thing we might say to say it is finished but it cost Jesus so much and cost him everything, his life, and again, the sacrifice that was made and what took place in Scripture and the accounts that we read about and physically fulfilled on that hill of Calvary was done that, again, it might be finished and paid in full by Christ himself. The simplicity of Christ. Don't complicate that particular thing. It was paid in full. Secondly today, I thought of something else that I think is simple that, again, the devil frustrates so much of, and that is, and these do somewhat go together uh, by, if you think about it, it, it'll complete the message when you see here in a moment as we look at these other couple of points. But the second thing is the grace of God. I've already used the phrase that you'll find that uh, Paul even mentions about frustrating the grace of God. And uh, again, the grace of God is something that we don't want to remove from being simple. Now, is the grace of God simple? Uh, on one hand, yes. <laughs> and that meaning that Jesus did it all and that you and I come by grace not having to earn it. On the other hand, we can say, well, grace is a very deep subject. And again, when we look at it spiritually and theologically, we can talk of the grace of God for a long time. Matter of fact, I'm sure I own, uh, I know of one, and I think I know of a couple of books that I've got. The grace is in their title. And the whole book uh, was written of the subject of grace. And they're, again, just uh, books that somebody has expounded on and thought about that particular subject. And there's probably volumes that could be written about what God has done, his unmerited favor toward man, the grace of God extended to you and I. But, you know, if there's something that is frustrated in this world, and something that is removed from being simple, the grace of God is probably one of those things. Because again, the world comes and Satan comes saying that not only is our salvation maybe not finished in Christ, as we said in the first point, but that it's not all of grace and that we find ourselves having to do something else to obtain the salvation that Christ freely gives. And so if we frustrate that grace, and then it's no longer of grace, the Bible tells us. Paul says that, again, if we add to it, it can't be both. It can't be grace and some works. It's either all of grace or none of grace. And so, again, we want to keep that simple, if you will. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So let us, again, not frustrate that 
uh, that uh, particular uh, subject of grace. As a matter of fact, uh, something I always do in my pulpit, uh, because I know, as a matter of fact, I left an important uh, verse of that out. The older I get, sometimes my uh, memory. So I'm going to flip over and read those two verses to you, because I tried to quote them. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So I wanted to add uh, verse 9 to that and say that correctly. But again, the grace of God is something that we are extended by God. It's not something we earn, and we can't work for it. We can't do something to merit it. And Satan comes in his subtle way as an angel of light. And so often he uh, complicates the grace of God by adding the things that he does. And you might say, well, what does he add? What would he add to the grace of God? Well, when you think about it, religion so often, and by religion, I mean anything else that comes that'll tell us in the name of God or to earn some merit with God or and or to earn our way to heaven or to gain a place in heaven that we have to do a certain amount of things, or we have to do anything at all other than freely accept the gift of Christ on the cross. His grace comes freely to you and I. It cost him everything, but again, it comes freely to you and I. May we not frustrate the grace of God. If there was one thing that we could pick out that we wanted to keep simple, and uh, again, I think all this goes together and it makes a complete thought about Christ, but it's his grace. Because again, when we complicate that, then we make salvation unobtainable. Because, you know, if there was, as the scripture we read, some way that man could earn it. I seen a quote the other day, and I can't remember if it was uh, from uh, Charles Spurgeon or D.L. Moody, one of them, but they were uh, saying about how that they were uh, thankful. I can't remember exactly how it went. But in other words, they weren't going to be able to sit in heaven and listen to all the boasting of men of how and what they did to get there. And could you imagine how the people are, you know, how they are in this world that so often, and, and again, some of it being true, they may have done the things they say, but it's human nature sometimes to uh, say that, oh, I did this to earn this. I worked this hard. I completed this list. I checked all these things off, and therefore I merit heaven. And then we would start looking thinking, well, I merited heaven more than this guy. And it's human nature, is it not? And we think how we do in this world. But you know, you think that the grace of God comes to all of us because we are all in the same shape. We're sinners, lost and undone. And we have no hope in this world without what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. When we frustrate the grace of God, when we complicate and either add to or try to do something else to the grace of God, we no longer have God's grace. We've added works to it, whether they're religious, whether they're some kind of physical deed, whether just trying to live right in this world. Some of those may be admirable things as the world sees it. They may be even good things, scriptural things on the right thing to serve God, but we don't earn our salvation and we don't do them to gain heaven and to have our sins forgiven. Let us be clear on that. Jesus paid it all, first of all, and the grace of God is extended to every man, and it's the unmerited favor, something that cannot be earned, but it is given by Christ. Oh, that we might keep something simple. Thirdly today, as we think of that, we think of it was paid in full, finished by him. The grace of God, something we can't add to, don't take away, we leave it alone. It's God's grace extended to all mankind. But thirdly, we're sought by him. You know, Satan would surely complicate that in this world. As a matter of fact, uh, Satan would many times confuse people and say, oh, you can't uh, come to Christ unless you're uh, in the right place or at the right time. Maybe, uh, you know, some people think, oh, well, I'd have to go to a church to find Jesus. No, you can find him right where you are. As a matter of fact, it just simply takes a prayer of your heart to realize that you're a sinner and that you trust in that finished work on the cross of Calvary and believe that uh, the gospel that Jesus died and was buried rose again and that he would save you because if you ask him, the Bible declares if we receive him in our heart, turn from our sins unto Christ, repent and trust in him, the Bible says we can be saved 
and have a home in heaven and a relationship with Christ. And Jesus seeks us. He came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, Satan frustrates that so much in this world. He makes many people believe that they can't be saved. He makes a lot of people think, again, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that. I have to clean myself up. We have a number of people that think that in this world. Oh, that I have to, you know, I have to do this. Now, granted, I think there is a change in a person when they trust in Christ. But Jesus and the Holy Spirit will do that changing. We just come to Christ, as the old hymn says, just as I am without one plea, and we come to the cross, we come to Christ, and we simply bow there, bowing our heart, confessing our sins, and receiving what Jesus did. The simplicity of Christ. You know, I think if you read on, Paul is expressing the things that could come. Again, that there would be maybe false teachers who preach another Jesus, another gospel. They come with another spirit. And then later on, he even mentions about Satan's workers, and again, Satan himself transformed into an angel of light. Many things in this world are out to deceive man and to keep him from Christ. But oh, that we might remember the simplicity of Christ. A relationship with Christ and salvation through him is not something that is hard in this world. And it's not something that God has tried to hide from man or to keep from him in any way. Matter of fact, it's just the opposite. Jesus came to all the world that all the world might be saved through him. The simplicity of Christ. Oh, that we again might just keep him simple and keep it simple. Yes, we could write volumes on his book uh, on, or on books on what he did in his life. The Bible even tells us that, that the books of the world couldn't even contain all that Jesus did in this world while he was here just a small amount of time. And even the other doctrines and the things about the Bible, books have been written, will be written. Other things could be said about it. Much could be said. But when we break it all down, it simply comes back to that we must keep Christ simple and that we must keep the simplicity of Christ, that he paid it all, that his grace, unmerited, is extended to all, not bought by works, not earned in any way, but is free to all who come. And that again, he seeks us, and we can be saved. As the Spirit draws you, you can be saved and trust in Christ wherever you are. And no matter how far you think you've went away, if God draws your heart and the Spirit convicts, you can be saved today. You can trust in Christ. Know that your sins are forgiven and have a home in heaven. I encourage you to do just that. Jesus is seeking you. And uh, he seeks you in all the ways through conscience and creation, through his word as it's given unto you and as others that we give it out to and, and may uh, share his word. But trust in Christ today if you never have. But for the rest of us, let us remember to keep things simple, especially some important things. And the simplicity of Christ is something that Paul was encouraging the church at Second or in Second Corinthians, the church at Corinth, he was encouraging them to keep some things simple because the devil's going to do enough to try to make them all hard. The simplicity of Christ. May you know him and may you uh, again trust in him if you never have. May God bless you today.